So uh, it's a pleasure to have Uli Bauer speak to us about persistent matchmaking. Thanks, um, Constantine. Thanks for the introduction. It's a, it's a great honor for me to speak here in this virtual event at IAS and at the same time at home on my campus. Um, I'm going to talk about, well, I made up this title because I, I wanted to talk about a few things that, that I guess most of them are related in some sense to persistent homology and, and uh, somehow the, certain things being matched up is a common theme. And so I just put that in the title. So matchmaking is not, not anything particular that appears in any of the papers, but it's kind of a recurrent theme. Um, and, and, and so I'm going to um, tell you a few things about um, um, uh, several ideas where, where matching things up. Um, appear. Maybe I want to start with an advertisement. And um, this is uh, uh, Ripsa, which uh, some of you might know is, the, is a software I wrote for computing uh, barcodes persistence for VTORIS RIPS filtration. So you have a metric space, you have geometric data, and you look at the data at, at uh, various scales and you identify connectivity at, in various degrees using homology, using complexes that join the dots in. Um, if they're according to their proximity. Um, and so this, uh, I, I put up a new version last week. This is version 1.2. It's good because it's a bit faster, maybe about uh, twice as fast as before and also roughly uses uh, half the memory um, because it, it, it more um, efficiently uses something that has been there from the beginning, um, some ideas, but so it's, so it's basically a little implementation detail that leads to a substantial improvement still. And what's what's interesting now? It it actually we we are using this recently uh, to to work with uh, virus data. This is following ideas by Raul Rabadan, who's also involved in this project. And so we we are studying the data set of all uh, COVID genomes um, that are sequences so far and, and available in this GIS eight um, database. And well, what's interesting, and I was surprised by this, <laughs> the data set is is um, about. Uh, 93,000 points different distinct um, uh, genomes sequenced. And if you think about, it, if you do the calculation, what that means, if we want to compute first cohomology, we have to build up the, the full two-dimensional skeleton, or at least if you do it naively, you do this. And it's, it's a very large, and this is already a, a different number than what I put in the abstract because the numbers have already changed by then. Um, so it's it's really a large number of simplices. I mean, most of them are two-dimensional simplices. And of course, uh, well, all these simplices are involved in the computation, but uh, the, the trick, of course, is not, not to consider even all of them in, in, in the machine, but only as much as is necessary to compute the correct barcode. But I mean, this, this is, uh, I want to say this, this kind of uh, uh, misleading advertisement, it's kind of r rare that we can handle such large data sets. Usually it, um, RIPSA um, uh, will, will not be able to go that far, but here the data is very structured. I mean, and that's, that's kind of by principle, the, the evolution of these viruses is kind of tree-like and the RIPS complexes, if they were completely tree-like, they would, um, they would um, actually be um, trivial homology. They would always be collapsible at all scale. And we have something almost like that. So even though we have so many data points, we have very little homological features and RIPSA makes use of that and, and basically it has to deal only with the part of the data that has uh, non-trivial homology. And even though we have a lot of uh, points and, and really a lot of synthesis, um, we, we, we can still, and this is kind of on the, on the, on the limit of what we're currently able to do. So this will run for a week and use uh, hundreds of, of gigabyte of main memory. But we're, we're kind of chasing uh, the, um, like we're, we're being chased by, 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 by the, the progress of sequencing. So, so we're hitting the, the limitations soon. And at some point we will have to uh, include more ideas, but this is so far, um, this is from, uh, I think from uh, 15th of January, we could still handle every single um, distinct genome that's in that database. Okay, so that's that's going to be one one thing that I'm going to um, talk about. Maybe just to to refresh uh, your memory, I, I guess most of you have seen this at some point. Persistent homology um, means that you you are interested in the homology of a filtration of simplicial complexes, say k bullets. So we have first one complex which is just a 
single point, then we have two vertices, we join them by an edge and so on in this example. And then maybe eventually we also have something one dimensional, some, some one dimensional cycle and so on. Um, and we apply homology to this entire diagram, homology with coefficients in a field so that we get vector spaces and somehow the, the representation theory of the, the resulting objects is, is nice and it decomposes into a nice and simple uh, and some ends. So this is um, called a persistence module. This is simply a diagram. The, the persistent homology is a diagram of vector spaces indexed over like linearly over a finite uh, number of, of um, integers or maybe also more generally you can think of it as indexed over the reals but computationally it's always a finite number of values and those have a barcode. The barcode is simply uh, describing the isomorphism type of a persistence module. It's describing the, uh, the the pieces in the essentially unique decomposition into indecomposables. So this is what you often see here. Yeah. This is what, what RIPSA produces. If you go to life.ripsa.org and run the example there, you see something like this. This could be a torus. So you have maybe blue. This is zero dimensional features, um, basically, um, Clustering, single linkage clustering is, is very closely related to that. So yes, yes. things merge and then you have uh, two, two one dimensional features and a two dimensional feature that would be, uh, that, that, that's what a sampled torus would look like. Okay, and, and well, here's the first occurrence of the word matching. This, this can also be interpreted as a diagram indexed over the reals or over a finite num uh, collection of real numbers, uh, just as the filtration was a diagram of simplicial complexes uh, linearly arranged and persistence module was a diagram of vector spaces. And we can consider this as a diagram of basis elements if you want, but it's really a diagram of matching. So this is the category that has uh, sets as objects and then matchings, partial bijections as the morphisms. And the way you can interpret this as a, as a matching diagram, well, whenever you have a, a value S, for example, this scale value um, filtration parameter S, then you simply take a one element in the set for each interval that you hit. And then, well, if you have two element, uh, two indices S and T, and they both have their um, associated sets, and then the matching simply consists of those um, well, you match up those pairs that, that um, according to their, um, their common um, interval from which these elements are generated. So, so this is one interpretation and it's kind of a convenient interpretation because we, we're not leaving this framework that we consider all these steps as diagrams with a common indexing set, kind of linearly ordered indexing. And certain concepts like the concept of an interleaving make sense in this generality when we have two diagrams indexed over um, the reals we can we can talk about the interleaving, uh, which is on 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 the next slide. And well, the title is induced matchings. Here's another occurrence of matchings. And um, let's start with with uh, the notion of interleaving. This is a way of comparing two filtrations, or more generally, to um, our index diagrams of anything uh, in any category. But here, um, let's say filtrations of simplicial complexes, as we had before. And so here's the first one in blue. And then let's say we have a second one, um, filtration, or both indexed over the reals for now. And uh, let's also assume that we have an interleaving, which is a, is a pair of um, natural transformations between these diagrams one in green and I'm gonna use in a moment only this one and then there's a second one uh, in gray because I'm not gonna use it. And um, all of this data, so the internal maps of the filtrations as well as the interleaving morphisms should assemble into a big commutative or not so big, but a, a common uh, commutative diagram. So that's, that's an interleaving and the green uh, arrows um, are an interleaving morphism. So this is a morphism of persistence modules, uh, simply a natural transformation of these diagrams. And um, well, if we apply any functor in particular, if we study the homology of these two, um, the commutativity is preserved and we, get, we still get an um, interleaving. Now this is an interleaving of uh, the persistence modules. 
So uh, we're just adding homology everywhere here. Um, and now uh, um, induced matchings are a way of extracting um, combinatorial data from this interleaving morphism, just the green one. We, we need only one. We just need to know that a second one exists in order um, to make sure that that the, um, the statements that we we get in a moment actually um, are guaranteed to be true. Um, so we have this morphism of persistence modules, let's say this, this green one, which is uh, from the persistent homology of L to the persistent homology of K only uh, with the indices shifted by Delta. This is, you see that the arrows are slightly tilted. And so such an um, interleaving morphism induces a matching of the barcodes um, of the two persistent homologies, the blue one and the, yellow, uh, and, and the red one. And the way it's induced is really you go through the barcode of the image of this morphism and the image is itself a persistence module. The persistence modules are an abelian category. And we have, um, here we have something interesting that's, uh, I'm, I'm gonna illustrate it just uh, with, without being too formal about this, but somehow the, the matching is induced through this barcode of the image as an intermediate object in the following way. So uh, we start with the, the intervals in the barcode of the image. And uh, well, for um, let's say you blue, this would be the, the codomain. There's a um, um, there's an interval that that aligns with this at the at the uh, right endpoint. And that, there's a that's actually a theorem that that tells you that this has to be true. And at the same time, this is also true for the for the um, uh, domain for the domain of this morphism. This has to align at the left endpoint, and so. Uh, the alignment of the endpoints matches, uh, where it in injects every interval in the barcode of the image with uh, a unique interval of domain and a unique interval of codomain and composing these two injections that go zigzag, you, what you get is a matching of, of um, the intervals. And some um, intervals of both domain and codomain might remain unmatched. And you also see something geometric here that intervals um, that you start with in the image, um, they're always shorter than the ones that uh, you connect them to. And, and the, the one you start with is really the overlap of the two matched intervals in the setting. And well, these, these matched intervals, they look very similar and that's actually um, true. Um, and how similar they are depends on this factor delta that, that, that tilt in this interleaving diagram. Um, and this leads to a proof of uh, the, the stability of persistence barcodes um, in, in seen in, in the algebraic um, version. Um, this is originally due to Chassal and co-authors. And uh, their theorem says, if you have a delta interleaving of persistence modules, then it is possible to construct a delta matching of uh, the, the barcodes of these persistence modules. Um, so it is actually constructive. It, it's, it's more than just admits, but the construction they used in their proof is uh, not something that anyone has ever implemented. It's, it's based on, on, on an interpolation of the persistence modules in a sense, or basically you can interpret it as a Khan extension of, 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 the, um, of the diagrams that you, you set up from, from the data you have. Um, and, and it's it's kind of um, it is constructive, but in a in a rather indirect way. And what I just sketched on the previous slide is, of course, much more direct. This um, only requires you to compute three barcodes. And uh, while well, this was our um, later um, revamped version of the stability theorem that that says that an interleaving actually induces um, a delta matching in the, in the way that we have seen before. Well, this algebraic stability actually. Um, people got interested because um, it, it, it extends the stability of persistence barcodes um, arising from sub-level sets of functions um, as, as first shown in, in uh, four years earlier by, by David Kohn-Steiner and, and co-authors. 
Um, so th this is what I call classical stability here. Um, they, in that proof, they had some some tameness assumptions, some some regularity assumptions on the on the functions whose sublevel sets you consider, and the algebraic um, version of stability is a bit um, more general. It has weaker assumptions on on the tameness of the input. Um, it also allows you to deal with uh, filtrations of two different domains. In the original setting, you had two functions defined on the same domain. Um, so it's a bit more general. And, and one thing where it's also useful is, I think that that's what, what the authors, Fred Sala and co-authors were interested in, um, is to have a proof of Chrome of house of stability of Vietoris Rips barcode. So kind of the theoretical side of uh, what, what computationally is happening also in Rips there. And so, so there's a lot of interest in, in these um, um, algebraic stability results. And, and hence, I think it's also interesting to see how to construct uh, these matchings. And well, as we have seen, you need just three things. You need to compute the persistence barcode of the domain and the codomain. And you need to compute the persistence barcode of the image of your morphism. And I'm going to talk uh, um, now about how to compute that image. So. Um, let's just uh, start maybe with, with looking into the basics of persistence computation first. Um, so let's, let's stick with the example. Of course, persistence is more general, but here we are working with RIPS um, persistence. So the, the construction that, that gives us the filtration we're interested in is, is coming from a metric space, typically a finite metric space in, in applications. Um, and, and then we consider the RIPS complex. Um, which consists of all simplices, which are simply subsets of your, the points in your metric space, non-empty subsets, of course, uh, that have diameter less than your threshold T. So this gives you the ribs complex at parameter T and varying this parameter, you get a sequence of inclusions. That's your ribs filtration. Um, so that's kind of, um, as the name says, or Vitoris ribs filtration, it, it has been used by Vitoris in one of the earliest uh, uh, definitions of a homology theory for compact metric spaces. And then later by, by RIPS, uh, well, in, in the study of hyperbolic groups before even the, the word hyperbolic groups was introduced. And this was actually unpublished by RIPS, but then Gromov wrote a paper, uh, a famous paper where he uh, explains RIPS ideas. And, uh, and, and I think that's, that's where the, uh, the RIPS complex under this name uh, was popularized. And um, yeah, so we, uh, when we do computations, we, we have this filtration where uh, it's interesting to note that uh, many simplices typically enter the filtration at the same time. Well, you have, um, if you have a metric space, uh, you have only so many um, different uh, distance values, but you have way more simplices. So um, in computations, you need to, you, you typically work with a filtration where one simplex enters at a time. So it's, you simply refine that filtration. And what we're doing, uh, what, what's happening in RIPSA is uh, that the refinement is done by a lexicographic order um, of the simplices. So the vertices are given in some total order and that induces a lexicographic simplex order. And that's, that's how I break ties when, when multiple simplices have the same diameter and hence appear at the same time in the filtration. And also that's, now I set um, up the boundary matrices for this, um, for this, uh, for this filtration. Basically in the, in the end, it's, it's a boundary matrix of the full complex on vertices X and uh, but um, we think of this as uh, with respect to the ordered basis, which arises from this simplex wise ordering um, given by the filtration. So, so this is in a sense, this, this matrix encodes both the filtration as well as the chain complex. And often we also just consider if it's convenient to only consider uh, the P co -bound, uh, boundary matrix or co boundary matrix. I mean, the, the big boundary matrix is kind of has a block structure. We will see an example later. Um, so, uh, this is uh, the boundary matrix with respect to these ordered simplices. And then, well, uh, the computation, uh, if you have uh, set up um, everything this way, is quite easy. Although, if you do it this way, I'm, I'm going to uh, explain the, the the first naive way, and, and of course it's orders of magnitude away from from what uh, 
you will be doing when you do things very efficiently. But conceptually, it's it's quite easy. It's really just uh, Gaussian elimination, even without uh, without um, reordering columns or rows. So the goal is to reduce this boundary matrix. So we compute a new matrix R, which arises from the boundary matrix by oops, sorry, by um, change of basis of um, for the columns. So so we multiply uh, with a upper triangular matrix V and so to get the, the result in reduced form, which means that the pivots of this matrix are unique. Pivot really means the, the last entry in a column with a no, uh, the last index in an entry, or the last non-zero in in, entry in a column. That's, that's the pivot of a column. And the matrix is reduced if uh, the row indices where these pivot um, elements appear are different for each column. And I'm only consider the non-zero columns here, of course. I mean, there, might, there will be many zero columns and, and for them, the, the pivot would be zero. Um, and, and that's the only thing that, that doesn't have to be unique, but, but the positive pivots of non-zero columns have to be distinct. And of course, that's a way of telling immediately that, that the columns are linearly independent, for example. Um, and yeah, so this happens by a uh, full rank matrix is also upper triangular and the upper triangular form, what it means is really, oh, sorry, that what it means is this upper triangular shape uh, guarantees that it's a change of basis that respects the filtration order. The boundary matrix we started with uh, respected the filtration order and by multiplying with an upper triangular matrix, we maintain this property. So what it does really is it takes a generating set of the boundaries, the, the columns of this boundary matrix, and it turns it into a basis, but a basis that's compatible with the filtration. And that's all there is, right? That's, this is really what, what we need to do. Um, so maybe a little example, here's a triangle and, and this is the boundary matrix of the triangle. So, so um, three vertices, three edges. And then uh, this is the matrix in reduced form. Uh, so D and R, and this would be a matrix that puts it into reduced form. This is, uh, I'm, I'm working with uh, coefficients modulo two, here, which is common. Um, but yeah, I think just as common as um, we, to work with, with other prime fields as coefficients. Um, okay, and so, so what is like, why, why is it enough to just compute a compatible basis of the boundaries to compute homology? Well, I mean, the, the point is from the columns of the reduced matrix together with some of the columns of the reduction matrix V. So this is the one I multiply from, from the right. Uh, we get a complete um, uh, compatible basis for the persistent homology in the following sense. Um, the, whenever I have a non-zero column, so this is important to say it's this RJ um, is assumed to be non-zero, then it generates um, homology and well, it creates homology at the first time this particular cycle, it's, it's a boundary and, 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 and earlier on uh, at, at index J, it is a boundary in the filtration, but before that it, it's already a cycle. And the first time when it, appears in the filtration is the, the pivot index of this column. So the, the row index of its, of its pivot. And well, from that point on, it generates homology up to the point when it becomes a boundary and, and RJ is the boundary of the column VJ, well, just by this fo simple formula here. So this is the, the, um, the chain that kills it, if you want, this is the, chain bounding uh, the cycle RJ. And then from that point on, it's a boundary. And well, so in, in that sense, it's a compatible basis for persistent homology. And well, you can say even more, you can also interpret this, this whole computation as you change the basis of the filter chain complex from one that's only compatible with filtration namely that's the standard basis by simplicis. And you change it into one that's compatible with the filtration, but also with the chain complex structure with the boundary maps in the sense that you have now basically three types of uh, 
of, of basis elements, the one that, that create homology, will, which will die later than the ones that kill that homology, and then also essential ones. And I think the, the first time I've seen this uh, described in this explicit way, um, well, the first time I read it, it was in a paper by, by uh, uh, Mikel, who's also in the audience here, and, and, and Vin and, and Dimitri, uh, Vin de Silva and Dimitri Morozov. And it's actually present already in, in an earlier paper by, by Sergei Baranikov, um, where he describes that this is basically, there's, there's a way to decompose any filter chain complex into indecomposables. And uh, well, basically you're matching up these two elements here, um, the one that gives birth to homology and the, the, one that, the other ones that kill homology. And so in a sense, uh, computing homology and computing persistent homology is some kind of matchmaking process, but you have to even create the, the elements that you later wanna, wanna match up with. So, okay, so that's kind of a um, short summary of what, what, uh, what's happening in, in uh, persistence computation. And well, then, if you if you know this, you 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 can make some observations that that help you to speed up the computation. And I think the first one is probably one of the most important ones. That uh, a lot of the computations that are happening here in the um, in this matrix reduction are not necessary. If you have a, a column that's reduced to zero, then you know that the corresponding uh, column in the V matrix uh, generates homology at index i. But um, if that same um, index i already appears, or it will appear maybe later as a pivot of some other um, column rj, uh, we don't need that, um, that cycle vi that generates homology because we have another one already. Namely, we have that cycle rj. So now we have two cycles that both generate um, homology at index i. And this one, in a sense, is better because it's also one that's that's compatible with the filtration. It's, it's one that exactly becomes a boundary um, at index j. And for this one, we might not um, necessarily, this might kind of, kind of be, uh, so in, in a sense, this, uh, this cycle always generates a direct sum end um, of, of persistent homology, and this one is only guaranteed to generate a submodule, but this might not be this is, might not split off as a summit. So this is something we really have no use for in this case, and so it's better to avoid the computation. And as it turns out, computing this guy is is uh, typically much more expensive than in the other case when uh, R i is not equal to zero eventually. So there's a lot of computations that we should really avoid. And uh, well, only in the case um, <clears throat> that this, this index i has not been seen, we actually identify something interesting this way. These are the essential cycles, the cycles that generate the homology in the, in the last complex in the co-limit of the filtration. So um, the, the idea behind clearing, um, spelled out first explicitly by Chen Kerber in 2011. And interestingly, this is also an equivalent idea is also present in, uh, in in the the paper um, or in, in the cohomology algorithm that was first introduced by um, Dmitry Morozov or implemented by Dmitry Morozov and um, appears in in uh, the paper I mentioned before by De Silva uh, Morozov and Vedemo Johansson. So clearing means nothing but to avoid the computation of these columns that are not necessary for computing persistence. So. That's, that's all, we avoid unneeded computations. Uh, what it, uh, in order to be able to do that, we need to know <coughs> before we start reducing column J that we don't need it. And the way to do this is you have to reduce the boundary matrices uh, one degree after another, and you have to reduce them in decreasing uh, dimension if, you, if you're dealing with homology. And well, that's also a problem because that means it's this uh, optimization is unavailable in the top dimension that you start with. So think of um, a setting where uh, you wanna compute homology only up to de degree K. And so you need to deal with a K plus one skeleton. And the problem is the first thing you need to do is you need to compute uh, a basis for the K plus first homology even though you, you never ask for that, but th this is how, how the computation 
uh, get started. And that's, that's something we want to avoid. And that's why um, looking at persistent cohomology is, is actually the way, the right way to make clearing efficient. And these two ideas need to be uh, combined to, to, to really make things efficient. Uh, well, persistent cohomology, since we're dealing with with uh, field coefficients is simply a vector space dual. And, and that means it's, it's quite, since we're working, everything is finite dimensional here, we, we can, we have the same barcode actually. Um, and the way we can compute this is by reducing the co-boundary matrices, which are simply the boundary matrices transposed, and then the order of the bases um, reversed for both rows and columns. Uh, so everything somehow dualizes here. And also uh, the degree stuff dualizes. So now in computing persistent homology, if you wanna do this with clearing, you have to do the computation in increasing dimension. Now that's much better because well, clearing now is unavailable in the bottom dimension in, in dimension zero, but that's not a problem because in dimension theory, you have some, something much better than matrix reduction anyway. You can also compute persistent uh, cohomology or homology in degree zero using Kruskal's uh, minimum spanning tree algorithm. And uh, the persistence pairs are really a byproduct of, of that algorithm. And, and that's, that's much faster than anything else um, anyway. So um, this is how, why these two um, ideas uh, should be combined if you wanna compute persistent homology at a large scale. So we, we talked about um, computing image persistence, and now this is, we, we um, discussed, um, we, we discussed um, how clearing cohomology important. We're going to work towards uh, applying this also to image persistence computation. Um, but let's first uh, stick with cohomology for a bit longer and observe something. Well, actually what we're computing uh, when we apply our matrix reduction algorithms to the co-boundary matrix, we're not computing, um, like the, the, the easiest interpretation of this is that we are computing not absolute cohomology, but relative cohomology. Um, and this again is uh, nicely described in, a, in, a, in that paper I mentioned before uh, by De Silva um, and, and co-authors, uh, dualities in, in persistent cohomology. Um, so I'm gonna recap some, some ideas here and we're gonna actually take those results and make them functorial in, in, in a moment. Um, so what we have is a filtration here uh, of, of some complex that's called the final complex A. And uh, well, the, the co-chains now form a kind of um, reverse filtration. So we have, here we have a sequence of uh, monomorphisms of inclusions and, and on the co-chain level, we have a sequence in opposite direction of um, surjections. And well, what are, our um, algorithm actually requires, our matrix reduction algorithm requires a, a increasing filtration. And there is one in the cohomology setting. And that's if you look at these uh, relative uh, co-chain complexes. So you, you consider um, uh, the final complex relative to something in the filtration. And now if you um, simply apply this to your um, initial filtration, you, you get um, a sequence, well, it's actually a filtration a filter chain complex again in, in the way that we need, only that the arrows are drawn in reverse direction. But that's not an issue, right? We know how to reverse uh, numbers and that's all we need. So this is nothing but a particular type of filtered chain complex just from right to left. And we, can, we know how to compute the uh, persistent homology of that. And that's, that's really what we're doing. And that's really what you get if you um, if you plug in the the filtration co-boundary matrix to the matrix reduction algorithm, so um, that that when I what I said on the previous slide was kind of not quite um, accurate. What what we get by reducing the co-boundary matrix is actually persistent relative cohomology, and well that's not a problem because somehow absolute and relative homology um, determine each other, so they have not the same barcodes. But um, if you know one, you know the other. That's this by, by this paper I mentioned several times now. And um, I'm, I'm gonna show you like a new perspective that, that lets you see how um, they determine each other. And this is really just a long exact sequence argument. So you start 
with a short exact sequence of filtered chain complexes. The first one, I'm going to do this in homology now because um, I, I find this is just the, the, uh, the short exact sequence of a pair. And most commonly, you find this in the textbooks in the homology setting. But it's the same in cohomology, just with, with uh, going in opposite directions, of course. So this is just to make it maybe more uh, closer match to what you're familiar with. So we have, um, it's, it's basically like the, the short exact sequence of, um, of, of a, a pair, now only in, in the filtered setting. So this is a, a chain complex of filtrations or equivalently a filtration of chain complexes. And um, so th this one here in the middle is the constant filtration consisting of the final complex at every step. So this, is this complex A all the time. And then to the right, oops, sorry. Um, there is a relative um, chain complex or relative filter chain complex, the, the final complex relative to the earlier steps in the filtration. So this is a, a short exact sequence um, of filter chain complexes, but particular persistence modules, and it, it induces a long exact sequence in homology. Um, and it looks like this. Um, let's see. So we, we have, um, basically the, the point is what we're interested in is uh, the absolute homology or uh, equivalently cohomology. And what we are computing is the relative thing, but, but um, well, the third thing in the long exact sequence is, is very easy to determine. And then uh, you can piece together things. Uh, and what's, what's particularly nice here, this, this long exact sequence also splits. So, so we actually have, um, it splits at two places, namely at the, um, the, the places on the left and on the right, um, in the following way. I mean, it's easy to see because, um, because we know um, all of these, um, so the persistent homology, and well, the same argument also applies to this relative persistent homology. They both have barcodes, and they, um, so these decompose uh, maybe in a non-natural way, but, but um, we certainly have, um, we can compose it more coarsely into um, the parts of the barcode that go on to infinity, the intervals um, corresponding to essential homology. Uh, and then the rest, oops, sorry, the rest which dies. And I'm gonna indicate this here with, with infinity and, and with this dagger. And in a moment, I will actually define this in a functorial way. So here, maybe for sketching this, we're, we're using the barcode. The barcode tells us that, that there exists a splitting, a non-natural one, but these <coughs> we'll see in a moment are actually functors. And well, this, this part basically is the, the image of, of this map in homology from the, this is from, from the persistent homology to this constant um, homology of the final complex. The image of this is the infinite part <clears throat> and the image of the, the finite part is simply the, the image of the connecting homomorphism in a long exact sequence. And well, also the relative um, persistent homology splits. <clears throat> and this um, image sits also as a summand. And then the, the other summand, the, the complement to that is um, the one, everything is reversed here. So while we in, in, the, in the filtration, in, in the persistent homology of the filtration, we have things that extend to infinity. In the relative <coughs> part, we have things that extend from minus infinity. Okay. <clears throat> so just as an, as an illustration of how this looks like, um, here we have a barcode, um, a relative barcode in, in degree k, and then the, the finite, the bounded part of this appears uh, in the same way also in the uh, in one degree lower in absolute cohomology, and then there's this infinite interval and, and that's kind of the, the first, uh, the, the third thing in, in uh, the, the, the third property of the long exact sequence, uh, the infinite intervals in the, in, in the next thing, in the next relative thing are exactly the complements of the inter infinite intervals of the absolute thing. So this is um, basically a recap of what, what has been known 
from this 2011 paper. And um, well, we're gonna we're gonna make this functorial. As I said, how how do we compute um, image barcodes from this? Um, now let's say um, where um, and this is why we we have to make things functorial. We we have to deal with, with morphisms and we have to understand the effect of these um, taking finite or infinite parts on the level of um, not just on the level of objects <clears throat> but also on the level of morphisms. So we have two filtrations, K and L. We assume um, we filter the same space and the morphism, um, the inclusion of the two filtrations, let's call it K. And the goal is to compute uh, the barcode of the, um, the image of the map in homology. So the, the image um, persists in homology. Um, and the question is how to do this. And, and the ideas um, from, like, uh, from, from the paper from 10 years ago, um, they don't really tell us how to do this because, well, the long exact sequence, which is also, um, this is not explicitly how it's, how it's done in that paper. <clears throat> the long exact sequence is functorial, but um, on the other hand, uh, the images um, of, of, the, of, the, of the map, of the inclusion map here and the induced map and homology, um, may no longer be exact. So somehow the same ideas that, that work just for the objects, domain and codomain uh, might not apply for the image because we don't have a long exact sequence of, of the images here. Um, so, but we can, we can uh, use the, the ideas we have seen before that, that somehow took the, the uh, barcode or took homology and, and split it in two parts. And we're going to do that also for um, for for um, images. Um, just to recap some previous work on computing image persistence. So there, there's a paper by Edelsborough, Nahara, and Morozov, and they consider a particular setting. The the smaller filtration is always <clears throat> the intersection of the larger filtration with a with a fixed um, subcomplex. So this is why it's called a one function. Um, uh, setting and well, this was before people uh, started thinking about clearing. So this is not part of this paper. And then there's also um, <clears throat> a later a paper. This doesn't really apply to homology, but it's a slightly different setting. It applies to presentations of persistence modules. And well, what I'm going to explain now is um, enjoy work with Max Schmal. We we have a more general setting than the the one considered earlier. We have arbitrary filtrations of a um, common um, final complex. And this is a way that allows us to adapt clearing and cohomology computation. Um, well, and, and the way we start is by, by making these constructions of, of taking finite and infinite parts functorial. We start with a persistence module. Let's take the ones that appear as persistent homology that have finite intervals and intervals that are born somewhere and go to infinity and then um, well, there's the, the finite part of that <coughs> basically has to drop this interval. I'm sorry. And the infinite part <coughs> has to drop the, the finite interval. Um, and, and well, there exist functors that realize this and there's, there's an injection here of the, of, um, so it's a monomorphism of the finite part into the original module and an epimorphism of the, um, of the original into the infinite part. And well, it, it arises actually, this is, um, if you consider the, the, the co-limit, which we um, well, corresponded to this, this final complex A. So the co-limit of your persistence module and you, so this is a vector space. Now you turn it uh, into a persistence, a constant persistence module by this diagonal functor. And then <clears throat> this infinite part is just the image of the co-unit uh, sorry, sorry, of, the, of the unit of this adjunction of co-limit and diagonal. And this part is the kernel. So in a nutshell, there exist functors that do what you want. There, there exist functors that take the infinite and, uh, and the finite part. And of course, you can now you can also look at more general um, persistence modules that also extend to the left. And if we look at relative homology, we have to do that. And then there might be intervals that go from minus infinity to plus infinity. And the situation just gets uh, more, more uh, interesting. We also have uh, a, a part of the persistence module that's, that's born somewhere. That's, that's what we call the nascent part. 
and we have an epimorphism here. And we have the, uh, the ancient part is what we call this one, the, the part that existed forever um, back in time. And well, this again arises as the image of the, <clears throat> this time of the co-unit of the limit diagonal adjunction. And this is then the kernel of the co-unit. And well, now you can also form other functors here. Um, this one, so you have a map from the ancient to the immortal part. And the image of that can it takes you all, only the, the, the intervals that go from minus infinity to infinity. And similarly here, you have a map from a death part to birth part. And uh, the image of that map gives you another functor that only takes the, the, the finite intervals that, that have birth and death. And you can also construct pullbacks and get another functor. You can construct pushouts and get another functor. So you get all kinds of functors that um, without, without constructing the barcode, which is a non-functorial thing, uh, select the parts that, that um, according to the lifespan. And this is why we call all of those lifespan functors. And we need them to somehow make uh, the image computation um, um, work um, in, 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 in the same way that we, we, we did the, um, the, the computation um, cohomology versus um, um, or relative cohomology versus absolute homology in, in the same way we want to apply this to, uh, to images. And well, let's see. So, so here's, here's another thing that we need and that it just extends the previous diagram, which, which was already a bit uh, full. So, so uh, here again, we have the co-unit of the limit diagonal adjunction. And we can also take the kernel of that co-unit and that gives us, I mean, it's, it's more interesting to just look at the pictures to see what it does. It takes the complement of the, of the in interval here um, that, that dies, but it extends back to minus infinity. And we have seen these, like the, the, these complements played a role before um, in our description of, um, of, of um, the absolute relative correspondence. And um, well, we, this is why we need these, these functors um, that, that actually make this correspondence um, um, or this, this taking complements of intervals and realize it as something factorial. Yeah, now, now let's just see how, um, how these lifespan functors help us see the picture. Let's start with, with uh, um, what we, we, we have seen already, uh, just um, relating persistent absolute and relative homology. So we have seen um, persistent homology splits into two summons, the one uh, persistent homology of a filtration, there's the part that dies and the part that never dies. Uh, this is a splitting that's um, coming from the interval decomposition and it's not natural, but here we have isomorphisms that um, we got from the uh, relative long exact sequence. So we, we identified, so this was basically uh, the image of the connecting homomorphism and here's another one. Um, and here we, you see this, uh, this complement functor appearing. And this is basically again, uh, uh, summarizing in, in an, well, mostly functorial way, um, why we have this correspondence of um, relative homology to absolute homology. And, and um, well, it, 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 why it's separate on the, on the uh, death part um, corresponding to the birth part of, of relative. And here the infinite part of absolute corresponds to um, uh, the, um, the other infinite part of, of relative homology. And then the last two steps here are really just, well, here we have um, persistent homology and we can just take vector space duality to end up with persistent cohomology. And these are the objects that we can actually um, compute efficiently. And uh, from this, well, this is just a, another diagram that shows how, how the things, um, again, uh, pers persistent relative cohomology is, uh, can be computed efficiently with clearing. And this diagram shows you how it translates to give you the thing that we asked for, namely persistent absolute homology, at least in terms of barcodes. Okay, <clears throat> um, now, now, well, if we, if we wanna do the same for images, um, things are a bit more subtle, but the, the, these functors, these lifespan functors help us. So this is our setting. We have a, 
um, an inclusion of filtrations. We also have, um, well, an induced inclusion of relative filtrations here. Let's call that phi. Uh, what we want to compute is the image uh, in homology. And again, we split it. We know it can be split into a, um, a, a mortal part and an immortal part. And well, on the other hand, this below here is what we can compute efficiently with clearing for images. We can compute um, the, the nascent part, the, the birth part of, um, of relative homology um, or equivalently cohomology. And um, we, this is another thing that we can compute is um, the, the infinite part of relative um, homology just, um, just for the domain of the filtration. Well, now, and, and what would we now see here is uh, an isomorphism that we get from the long exact sequence again, from the relative long exact sequence. Um, well, but now you see that these things, there's kind of three things that we have, what we want, what we can compute, and an isomorphism we get from, uh, from the long exact sequence, but we need to connect the, the, these up and, and th what we need to do is here to, uh, these are not exactly the same. We need to switch the order of taking image and applying the death part functor. So this is the death applied to an object. This is the death applied to a morphism. And while these are actually isomorphic under certain assumptions, namely if uh, the co-limit um, of this map F in homology is a monomorphism, which we have in, in our setting, by the way. So this is why we get this one, but you see it's, it's, it's a bit subtle. And similarly, if the limit of uh, the map, um, of the relative map is an epimorphism, which we also have by assumption, um, then we get this isomorphism. So this, this is why in this paper, we actually study the behavior of these lifespan functors and how it commutes with kernels, um, images and co-kernels. This is kind of our, a reason for, for um, exploring all these of properties of the lifespan functors. But now you see, we can nicely connect what we can compute efficiently to what uh, we were asking for in a, in a big diagram. And yeah, here on the right-hand side, there's a similar story. And you see here, there's, there's this complement part and uh, these two parts, um, as, as, as we said, we, we saw they're complementary, so they determine each other. This is not an isomorphism, but a one-to-one -one correspondence. Okay, um, maybe just uh, another um, uh, quick view at, at computing in image persistence. Uh, what, we, what we have to do now is, um, uh, let's just look at the, the homology part without clearing, um, how to, compute image persistence in the setting that we sketched is we, we reduce the, the boundary matrix for the L filtration. And then we set up a matrix uh, where uh, the columns are ordered according to the K filtration uh, so, and the rows are ordered according to the, the other filtration. Those might be different orderings of the synthesis. And we reduce both in different ways because the, um, the orderings might have changed. And this uh, is what we need to determine uh, the barcode of the image. Uh, it can then be given as the pairs ij, um, where i is the pivot of the chaith column in the image reduced matrix. And then for the infinite, for the essential classes, we need, this is why we need the second, um, the second re matrix reduction. This is where we learn where the infinite, where the essential classes are born. So this is an explicit formula, but this is now <clears throat> just without any clearing and, and just computing in homology. So again, this is kind of uh, what, what we, we saw at the beginning of the talk is too slow to be um, feasible in practice. Let's see what we need to also apply clearing just as an overview. Uh, clearing for image persistence requires us, well, in homology, it requires us to uh, perform three reductions. We have to, reduce the matrix for L, the one for K, and then the image one that we have seen before. And um, well, this gives us the, the infinite part um, of, of the image. This gives us the finite part of the image. And this third one is just, just there for clearing. And it also gives us, by the way, the infinite part of the, of the relative homology, but this is something we haven't asked for here. So um, this is why I ma made it gray. Um, in cohomology, which we need to do anyway to perform clearing efficiently, 
the picture is a bit different. So computing cohomology can be interpreted as a reduction um, by by multiplying from the left instead of from the right. I mean, this is basically the because the that is still the boundary matrix, and now this is a way of of encoding the transposition of the matrix that I mentioned earlier. So again, we have uh, three. Uh, we, we can uh, reduce these three, but we actually, um, interestingly, need only two of them because this one now becomes unnecessary. This will only give us the barcode of the infinite relative part. And, and we haven't asked for that. And this one gives us the finite um, uh, absolute homology part. And this one gives us simultaneously the infinite part and gives us the information we need to apply clearing to, to that matrix. So, so surprisingly, like um, cohomology has two advantages. We, we can do clearing efficiently and we actually need to um, perform only two instead of three of these reductions. Okay, um, what, how, how uh, long is my talk scheduled? How long should I, should I go? I don't know what. You have another five minutes. Okay, good. Make sure that I, yeah, four minutes. Okay, yeah. Um, well, maybe I, I'm going to say a few things here. Um, I have some parts that I can skip, but I think this is nice. This is very easy. Um, this is something that, that is quite crucial in RIPSA, and the idea is very simple uh, to carry out this reduction only implicitly in, in some sense. So the reduction matrix V is actually stored in memory. The boundary matrix is not stored in memory because this is really just a formula that you can read in any textbook on linear uh, on, on, on algebraic topology. And that's what we're doing. We're recomputing columns of the boundary and co-boundary matrix whenever we need it. But this is never stored as a whole in memory. And in contrast to, to almost all other uh, persistence implementations before. And now the reduced matrix is also not stored. This is computed and then thrown away large parts of it. So all we store is the pivots and uh, we then recompute all the other entries by <coughs> carrying out this matrix multiplication. The reason is that typically this V is very small. Uh, D is very, has very few columns and very many rows. I mean, that's because in RIPS complex, the, the number of simplices increases very quickly with dimension. And that's why this is, makes sense to throw away a lot of the, this uh, matrix R because we can very quickly recomputed when we need it. And all we need actually in the code um, <clears throat> quite often is the, the knowledge of the pivots. So this is the only thing we need, but this, this will be much less information. And that's that's one thing that really makes this, this computation faster. Um, unless, and, and, and this is kind of the change in the new version of RIPSA, um, I'm throwing away the pivots even <clears throat> in, in some cases, uh, if they're apparent and what means apparent, I'm gonna show in an example here in the next slide. Um, Apparent pairs are um, persistence pairs that you can recognize immediately from the boundary matrix. Um, and this is uh, how simplices in the filtration find their perfect partner. Um, so here's, I'm gonna set up a um, boundary matrix. Um, so this is, these are the blocks. This is the degree one, um, then there's degree two boundary matrix and here's degree three. Um, and let me, so this is the boundary matrix for um, a simple RIPS filtration coming from, from this data. We have a three by four um, rectangle. <clears throat> and here um, highlighted are persistence pairs that can be identified immediately because already in the on, in initial boundary matrix, these are both column pivots and row pivots. So they are reduced from the beginning. And this is very easy to detect also computationally. Um, so, and all of these pairs, I'm not even storing ever in, in, in memory either. And that, that somehow now the, the, the point is in many data sets, an overwhelming um, number of, of entries is of that kind. Uh, let me just show you also how, uh, how um, I might not even build up the, the whole um, boundary matrix column. Um, in this previous example, so I, I want to uh, determine the boundary, uh, the, uh, so the, the boundary column of this uh, simplex with vertices three to zero. And well, what happens actually, I have a, these facets in lexicographic order, and this is the order in which I'm enumerating them. And here uh, in the matrix, I'm, I'm sorting um, according to 
diameter and then within the same diameter in reverse lexicographic ordering. And now when I'm enumerating the entries, so I'm sorry. Um, so this is the first entry that's enumerated, then that's the second one. And now this has the same uh, diameter. This uh, edge three zero has the same diameter as, as the triangle three two zero. And now I know this has to be a pivot because whatever comes after that, um, by the way, the ordering is defined here, will be further up in, in this um, column. And that's why I can stop here. I have identified the, the apparent pair without even enumerating um, the further entries of that column. And that's, uh, that's a shortcut that the device uh, gives you another big computational advantage. Um, Okay, so let me let me just uh, show the final slide where, where I mentioned this data set of um, COVID um, virus um, sequences, and well, this is has been suggested by by um, Chen and co-authors uh, um, Chen and, and and Carlson and Rabadan, and and the idea is that if you study viral evolution, then this is mostly tree-like, and well, if you have a, a this kind of tree-like uh, Evolution, then the RIPS filtration will be acyclic, will have no, no interesting homology. But there's certain events um, that, that um, cause uh, homology to appear in, in degree one. And the first type of event is a recombination, which might, um, well, in, 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 in many cases, um, not, not necessarily, but it, in, in some cases, it might create um, a visible H1 feature in, in the RIPS filtration. And the other one, it's also interesting is a uh, homoplasy and that means that we have a mutation in some gene and then we have some other branches um, and later on we have another mutation independent from that one happening and that also creates a feature in h1 and well this is why like basically when we we try to study this data set we're looking for um, such features and we're trying to identify these uh, well, investigate these two types of interesting events in the evolution and well, here's one example, just to wrap up this talk. And this is a particular mutation that has been discussed in the press. And at the time of when we took this data set, um, mid-January, uh, this was still quite rare in the data set, but it already appeared um, several times in uh, persistent cycles that we observed in, in the data set. So it's, it's kind of interesting that it seems that you can indicate something interesting even if the mutation is not quite common in the in the data set. And so other typical methods which would look for a high prevalence of a mutation um, would only detect this much much later. So so the hope is that maybe maybe uh, this gives us tools to <laughs> see interesting features in this huge data set more quickly than with traditional methods. And I think that's a good uh, good place to stop. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Never quite know how we're supposed to applaud in these. Uh, yeah. um, so, I mean, we're past the normal stopping time, but uh, so people who have to leave, obviously it's very easy for people to leave, but if you have questions, uh, uh, I'm sure Uli will, will answer them. I have to leave, but I wanted to thank you for the talk before I do. Thank you, it was great. Thank you. Uh, comments or there's something in the chat right I, I yeah there, there, yes there, it'll be available online you go to the videos link at math.ias.edu and you'll you can find it there and i remind everybody that next week or two weeks from now henrik renellenfish is renellenfish is speaking um on uh the physics of functional networks if anybody would like to um be on the mailing list, send me an email, commune at upenn.edu, and I'll put you on the regular mailing list. All right, then let's thank Uli again.